Our guest speaker tonight is uh, Ray Chisholm. He's a lifelong, or almost lifelong resident of Relay. He moved there when he was, what, five years old? Um, and he lived there, <coughs> he, went, he decided at one point he was going to buy the old Relay Hotel. And then he started getting interested in Relay history, so he started talking to other more chronically advantaged uh, citizens of Relay. <laughs> get, more get more information about Relay. He's amassed a vast amount of knowledge about Relay, and he likes to share it with people. He's on the board of the Tusco Valley Greenway. Okay. And uh, also on the board of the uh, Town Hall, whatever. In other words, you, you change light bulbs and unplug the toilets. Okay, just out of curiosity, how many people here live in Relay? How many here are lifelong residents of southwestern Baltimore County? Okay. Um, without any other ado, Mr. Chisholm. Bill, is this the one? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not used to the microphone. This is a pretty good crowd. Bill. <laughs> didn't expect this many people. Uh, this is my hobby. Before I start, I want to thank uh, three people. First of all, my wife who has to put up with me all the time. <laughs> Believe me, that's a lot. Bill Herman, who does all my slides and all this computer things because I'm computer illiterate. So. We'd like to thank a lady who's no longer with us. Her name was Lenore Reynolds. <coughs> she passed away this year. She was 99 years old. And she lived in Relay for almost 90 years. And up until about 92, I'd sit with her for hours, and she told me stuff that I can't remember. I mean, uh, I couldn't remember at that age, but she could. One of his examples was she remembers when she was like six years old and there was a guy pushing a wheelbarrow from New York to Los Angeles. And they stopped at Relay and stayed overnight. And she remembers that. She was five years old. But she's the one that really helped me with a lot of stuff in Relay. So I'm going to thank her. She, she lived to be 99. Relay is a hobby. Um, I have to put St. Dennis in there too because Relay and St. Dennis really go together. Uh, the first people in Relay were the Pictaway Indians and the Susquenots. The Pictaway had a large uh, village over by Washington, D.C. They used this area as a hunting ground. At that time, the Patapsco River was 500 feet wide. If you, can, you can't even believe that. And 20 feet deep at, at uh, Elkwood. The Susquehanna Indians were kind of more like they come down and they fought and fought, but by 1700, between the disease, white and the white men, and fighting each other, there was no more Indians left in this area. First white men came here and they in this area, and they built Elkridge Landing, and they needed a road. There's a large uh, shelf of land that runs from Pikesville to Elkridge, and it was called the Huntington Ridge Road. And the farmers in northern Baltimore County and Anne Arundel County built that road to roll hogsheads at the back of the to land to uh, Elkridge. You can believe that there were ships that would come up there. They weren't the large ones, but they were large enough that they could sail out to the Chesapeake Bay and transfer the cargo. And Elkridge was probably the busiest port in Maryland at that time. This was in the early 1700s. They changed the Huntington Ridge Road to Rolling Road because they rolled the hogsheads at the back of them. Then they changed that back to the Cadensville Road, who knows, and now it's back to Rolling Road. So politicians did that, so who knows why they did it. Uh, we're kind of lucky in Relay, we have probably the last original route running from 95 down to uh, Railroad Avenue by the railroad tracks. The rest of the road roads either been cut up or divided or widened or all the curves taken out. So if you come to Relay, you can see the original road. 
first industries in the relay area were iron ore. Uh, at that time, in order to make iron ore, you have to cut down a lot of trees, and there was, they'd make charcoal, they, and they used that to uh, make the iron. There's a couple pits still left around here. One of them was right across here, about 100 yards, 195 took it. That was uh, Stapleton's Pond. And uh, that was a little village there called Miller's Village because Miller owned the land and there was actually houses there. And some of them were still there in the 50s, I can remember. And the people that live, who have been here a long time can still remember the houses. But 195 took it and filled in the pit. Stapleton's Pond was great because in the summer we used to go swimming in it all the time with the cows and the horses and everything else, but it was really neat. They also built a road, which is now Gun Road. They call it the Avalon Mill Road because it ran down to an Avalon to the Avalon Mill on the Patapsco River, right where the new bridge crosses over in the state park, the car bridge. That was all destroyed in the 1868 uh, flood. Another pit was up by where the new relay school is, and if you if you go up, there's a bank you can actually see part of it. And two more, one on Mineral Avenue and the other one on the bottom of Francis Avenue. And the one on the bottom of Francis Avenue as a kid, we used to, you could fill up with water, we'd go ice skating on it. They just built two new houses on it now. It's hard to find, it's in the back. Relay until the 18, 1829 was just a wilderness and a bunch of farms and estates that people owned. But in 1829, the Beano was formed by a bunch of businessmen for, um, to produce a railroad. Originally, they wanted to make a canal from, from uh, Baltimore to Washington, but the water level was too low and it didn't have enough money and it, it just didn't work out. So they sent people, uh, Baltimore is a pretty important city, that they sent people to uh, England and they studied the railroad, so they came back and they said, well, we'll build a railroad to the Ohio Valley. Valley. Now, right now you think, well, that's nothing to, to do. But back then, that was like going to the moon because there was not another railroad involved in, in the United States. Nobody knew any what, what to do or how to make the, uh, the trains, the tracks, or anything. So it was a real big doing. So, so in 1829, they started to build the railroad. Sorry. Now, from they, they wanted to go 13 miles to Ellicott Mills, but they did survey another route that would have been north along the Jones Falls Expressway, but one of the Ellicotts was on the board of directors for the B&O, so <laughs> and then the railroad went to Ellicott City. So they didn't, they didn't know how to make cross ties. Or rails, they didn't even have the rails. They had to send to England for rails. So that, you know, they, they, and they didn't have a grade. It was worse than the uh, contractors rioted. They didn't, it, it was a really a major undertaking. But this is one of the original cross ties. Now you say it looks like a, it's a granite block. Well, they thought it would be a lot sturdier than wood, but it was much too expensive because you had to chisel all this, all this out and, and lay the blocks down and then nail, nail wooden stringers across here and nail the rails on top of it. And it was strap rail. It was probably two inches thick with holes in it. But it was so expensive they stopped it. So they only they used wooden ones from where the present Relay Hotel is back to Camden Yards and they used the, these stone ones all the way to Ellicott Mills. When he had the big fl flood and the hurricane, a lot of these got exposed. Now, these two are in my yard, because when I had to put a septic system in, in the front yard, I'll show you a little later, I found them. So in 1830, the first train left Camden Yards. Now, it was horse-drawn. They didn't have steam that way. 
and the horse could only go six and a half miles before he changed, he had to be ch to change another relay, and then it would go another six and a half miles to Ellicott City, he'd turn around and come back again. So a man named Dennis Smith, who St. Dennis was named after, was a local politician, and he found out where they were going to change horses at, so he quickly bought the land. <laughs> it was in the middle. And he built a roadhouse and tavern there. He figured, well, if they're changing horses, then I can really fleece the people when they're trying to get the... Uh... And then he contacted the railroad and said, I'll open a room and you can sell tickets here too if I can, you know, get a percentage or something. So he built the relay house. Well, it, was, it wasn't named relay house, it was just a house. And this is the picture of the horses getting changed. And that poor horse, there was 30 people in that way. But you have to remember there was only a 1% grade because the engineers knew they didn't want anything over 1%. Eventually it went to 3%, but 1%. So the first, the first, it was 75 cents round trip, which was a lot of money because some people were making $2 a week. So, I mean, it was a big thing, but people really enjoyed it. And the original railroad was to haul freight, but then they found out that everybody wanted to ride it, so they figured they could make some money on it, so they, they did this. Uh, the second train that went the next day carried George Carroll, or Carrollton, Charles Carroll Carrollton, the only signer of the Declaration of Independence to ride a railroad in the United States. That's one of the first in relay. Now, this is the present Relay Hotel. And when I was putting the septic system in, right along here, you could step off the porch onto the red, the tracks were about three feet underground. And they were still there. It was a nightmare, but I saved some of the original blocks and the rails when we took it up. But you could step off here and catch the train this one went to Baltimore, and this one went to Ellicott Mills. And they were pretty smart. They double-tracked it to Ellicott Mills, too. They didn't do that for a lot, for a lot of uh, destinations. And now we come to the famous race. Now, even though the horses were, were, were working, the b and was still experimenting with steam because they had gone to England and found out that the steam engines were a lot more powerful and a lot less trouble than horses. But the Beano still bought a large farm that stretched from the present Beltway to the Patapsco River. They kept that farm for a long time. Eventually, they held the fair of the Iron Horse there. But they leased the farmland out to farmers, and they kept the money for it. Now, the famous race was uh, the horse, that just, the horse and, uh, wagon that just left the relay house and Peter Cooper had come down with the Tom Thumb here, which is kind of funky looking because it would, Tom Thumb would probably been about half his size. And, and they met up with each other and they were going to ride. They were going to have a race. Now these were all appointed directors for the BNO. Now, I don't know about you, but if I got the appointed directors in a wagon and I'm going to have a race, I, I don't think I'd race with them in the back of the wagon. <laughs> And so we don't know if this is true, but it's a good myth. And another thing is, it was only written about 50 years after it happened. It, it wasn't in the local papers. I've even checked everywhere, but I don't want to destroy the myth. But you also notice the horse has got all four legs off the ground. Like 100 mile an hour. I don't, I don't understand, but I don't want to destroy the myth. Okay? Now, this is, the re this is the original relay house. Uh, it, it had, oh, I'm sorry, let me go back here. This is, the, this is the stables where they originally kept the horses. They brought, the horses were like where the Calvert Distillery, well, you all, some of you know where the Calvert Distillery used to be, where that was where they kept the horses. They brought them over here, but it didn't last very long. By 1836, they didn't have any horses anymore. So, I, I guess this is an apartment house. Uh, here's the station right here. 
and the boardwalk where you step there. This is what it looks like today. Now, when there was a big fire in 1898, and it burned a lot of the building down, when I moved in, part of the, this was here, but I had to tear it down because it collapsed. Uh, this is the back wall of the stables. It's a garden right now. And the garage is here. But I did save the original wall. That's probably the oldest wall in Relay, so it was built in 1830. By, even when they pointed to uh, um, Alcott Mills, the local politicians wanted to build a line to Washington because they knew all the money was there. So they'd even surveyed that while they were still using the horses. So in 1833, they decided to go and they had to build the famous Thomas Viedon. And this painting was painted by Mr. Latrobe, who actually built it. Now you'll notice how high these things are. And they were pretty high, but right now it's probably here because the river silted in that much. Not even more than that. I mean, some of these you can't even see it. But it was quite a feat. And this guy wasn't an engineer, he was a surveyor. He'd never built anything in his life. Now his father was a famous architect who, who built a lot of buildings in Washington. So he started out to build it, and everybody thought he was a nut because it was a curved bridge, curved arc bridge. And they said that it would fall under its own weight. Well, everything went along fine, until they had to start to build these piers in the river. And they had to build what you call coffer dams, and what you do is you drive boards down in the ground, or in the circle, and then you get some guys some nuts to grow down inside and dig all the dirt out of there, while down the bedrock. Well, they didn't have any power machines, so they had to hire people. Now, if you live in Relay, and if you've dug two feet down, <laughs> you'll find out that the clay is so bad that it sucks the end of your shovel off. <laughs> when I was putting the septic system in, it almost ruined the backhoe. That's how bad it was. Well, it was really bad for these guys working. It, it, the river uh, flooded, it collapsed. There was even, I read an article where Mr. Latrobe himself was down in there trying to dig it out. But they finally did it, and they got, they got the piers done, it took them three years to build it. it. It at that time it was the largest public service building project in the United States and the largest bridge being built. Uh, it cost a grand total of two hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> he was smart enough. He used a local granite and he ran a. Uh, spur off the old main line from Ellicott City and they brought the he built the scaffold along here and he brought the blocks out and put them down and uh, Mr. Dilts has made a really good CD the Greenway Corporation has it of how he built the Thomas Viaduct and it's really it's really neat how they did it well when they got it done nobody would drive across it <laughs> you know, they brought the grasshopper engine out that would weigh two and a half tons. And they bribed the guy, and just the engine went across. Now, one engine weighs six and a half tons now, and, the, and a coal train is the heaviest object on earth moving, and they park on this bridge sometimes. Another sign when Hurricane. The hurricane came, I remember, every one of these arches, the water was to the top, and a tractor trailer floated down on the other side from the city, hit the bottom, and came on, up on the other side. And it didn't budge. Unfortunately, uh, other things are destroying the bridge now, but that didn't do it. <coughs> Mr. Latrobe was never well after he built this bridge. It almost killed him. Uh, he did come back to work with a B&O, but it cut his life really short because it was a monumental undertaking. 
and it's still the longest curved arch stone railroad bridge in the world. I mean, there's nothing else like it. I was talking to a B and O engineer one time, or I'm sorry, CSX. I hope that there's nobody here from CSX. And he, I said, "Well, why don't you all do a little help on it?" He said, "Well, we if we did if we restored this bridge, we'd have to fix all the rest of the bridges up. We have we have six thousand bridges." I said, "But there's is there do you have another bridge like this?" Oh no, this is the only one in the world. I said, "Well, does, don't you think that would help?" Well, we just we don't, we don't have the money. We'll go from there. When they completed this bridge, the relay house really took off. Because if you wanted to go out west, you had to come from down south through Washington up to the relay house, which was right here, and catch the train and go up to Harper's Ferry to go out west. This was, this was taken in 1858. Relay was the relay house was the second busiest passenger station on the B and A's line. The only Camden station in Baltimore was busy, so uh, it was a, it was a big deal. And you wonder, if you think to yourself, well, why did they kept the relay house when they got rid of the horses? Well, here's the reason: water. Steam engines need a lot of water, and behind the house is a large cistern. There, it was. 15 feet deep and 30 feet wide. When I moved there, I had to fill it in because it had collapsed, but it did save a lot of bricks to make the fireplaces. But they used these waters, this water filling thing, until 1930. So it still was a really important thing. Now we get to the famous people. John Quincy Adams in 1830, this is, this is I'm going back a little bit. He wasn't, vice, he wasn't president, he was a senator. Senator. So, in that time, the senators didn't stay in Washington. It was only a part-time job. It's not like now it's a full-time job, and they still don't do anything. But the way they come. <laughs> when him and his wife decided they were going to come to Washington, well, she's not coming on the railroad because it's dangerous. It, it's only 13 miles long, but it's dangerous. So she goes by stagecoach and steamboat. He says, "Well, I'm going to take. I'm going to track out the railroad. We, we probably paid for it, but." So he came to Baltimore and he put his carriage on a, on a flat car and he rode out to the relay house and then he took the flat the carriage off and then he went to Washington on, on a turnpike. It probably took him another day to get to Washington. That was the first piggyback train in the United States. So another first. Jackson, the president, caught the caught the train from the from relay to Baltimore. He was the first sitting president. To walk to Riley. Henry Polk came here and met his vice president in the 1840s, and there was 3,500 people here to meet. I don't know where the heck they were going in relay because it's not that big, but they were, and they also had a 20, a 20 gun salute or something. So he's another famous person who came here. In the 1840s, Samuel Morse got his patent for the telegraph. Nobody wanted to fool with him. He, you know, it's a stupid idea. We're not giving you any money. But the BNA said, well, we'll let you use our right away if we can use the telegraph free. He said, okay. So he, they decided to build a line from all over Washington. They're going to put it on the ground, which was pretty good. So they designed this machine to burn it alongside the tracks. They put the wire in. It got as far as relay. Like, guess what it hit? <laughs> play. Couldn't go any further. Plus, they couldn't. They didn't know how to get across the Thomas Five. They, they couldn't. So they said, "Well, why don't you just put it on telephone poles?" So they put the poles up, and that's the first telegraph poles. Now, here's another bit. When I came to Relay, he's in a kid. On South Rolling Road, there was a little sign in its garage, and it said, "This is where Samuel Marsh worked." Well. I, that's kind of funny because it was like a mile from the state, from the tracks. Why would he work there? And it was a little tiny garage. So I, I got four or five books and read and read, got some more books and read and read. Sammy Morse was so bankrupt, he had to stay in Washington all the time to try to get money out of Congress to keep the job going. 
Now maybe one of his supervisors might have done that, stayed here, but there was a sign I can remember. Samuel Morris worked on a telegraph. So if some of you remember seeing that sign, I don't think that was right either. But here's another shot of the relay house. This is the second relay station. The first one was here where he went inside and got the tickets. The second one was this little shed here. So you got tickets. But you gotta remember this is an experiment now. People really didn't know what they were doing. But it was really busy. There were something like 35 trains a day were coming through here. And that's a lot of trains. This is the second, this is the second station that was built across from the present relay hotel. This is when it was really busy. I've done, done some research. This lady is Aunt Julia Weaver. She used to sell peanuts and fried chicken to the people on the trains and made a hell of a living. <laughs> this man here was named Mr. Hauser. He was station manager for 47 years. That's incredible because in, in nobody works 47 years for one company. Now, so. But these are the two lines going to uh, Ellicott City, and this is the only had they only had one line going to Washington before the Civil War. This is the same picture of this. This is what it looks like today. And there's the monument down there that they built. They said they built a monument for the guy who built the bridge, but it's not true. They did it for the directors of the B&O, and they're all listed on the sides of the <laughs> B&O. They're getting a little blurred, but they're still there. Well, everything was fine until 1861, and then the state started seceding, and they didn't know where Maryland was going. It could have gone either way. So when they had the riots in Baltimore, they burned all the bridges going north, all the bridges coming out of the south, <coughs> cut the telegraph lines. The mayor of Baltimore and the governor ran over to see Mr. Lincoln. Mr. Lincoln said he's nothing he can do about it. And, and they came back. Actually, Washington was cut off. He sat down with his uh, military advisors and they said, look, here's Virginia's getting ready to see. Maryland's going to get ready to, too. We're trapped. We don't have any roads going here. The only thing we have is this little railroad that's going to Baltimore, and they just had a ride. But here, what's this little place called Relay? And he said, well, that's the terminus of the two, th two uh, rail lines. The old main line goes out west. This one goes down south. Well, we've got to capture that or take care of it. They have no troops in, in uh, Washington politics again. So they went up north and they got Mr. Butler, General Butler, but he was actually a politician. He made himself a general. <laughs> and he got all his troops. They came down the Susquehanna River. They went down the Susquehanna to Annapolis. They came up the old B&A Railroad that ran from Annapolis to the Washington branch. He comes into Laurel. And he was smart enough to bring uh, and railroad engineers with him and repaired everything. He went over to Washington got some troops there, and the next day he came and occupied the relay house. Stopped all the B&O trains, because they thought they were shipping southern contraband to Harper's Ferry. He built forts up on here, over here. Everything was under martial law. You couldn't cross the bridge. You had to go down to the, uh, to the bridge at uh, Elkridge Landing. This is the picture of all this. When the trains came, they stopped and looked at This train was coming going toward Baltimore. Well, if you read about history about General Butler, he was really a terrible general after this. I mean, he did a lot of bad things in New Orleans. He was a lot of people. But in my opinion, he was a pretty smart.